Welcome to Scripted Ice, a hockey screen review podcast. I'm Andrea Todd. And I'm Mike Walker. And today we're going to review Untold Crimes and Penalties, the 2004 story of the Danbury Trashers, a crazy and fun hockey minor league team that had a sordid past. Netflix film has presented within their untold stories this story. And uh, the description that Netflix gives us is this. They were the bad boys of hockey, a team bought by a man with mob ties, run by his 17-year-old son, and with a rep for being as violent as they were good. Wow. And this is, this is really <laughs> the story of James Jimmy Galanti and his son, AJ, with a lot of commentary from UHL Commissioner Richard Brosel. So we came across this story. Um, it's not a new story. It's been out there for quite some time. Obviously, the actual story happened in 2004. So this is a story that's been out there for a while. But I am an avid follower of the Ma Museum based in Las Vegas. And um, I love that museum. Ooh. It's a great museum. And they actually posted at the beginning of hockey season this year, uh, the beginning of the NHL season, posted a thread about, they did a, a blog post about the time when the mob owned a hockey team. Yeah. And obviously that piqued my interest. <laughs> I was very excited As to hear it. As both a mob fan and a hockey fan. Right. <laughs> so I was unaware of this. And so it was very easy to go find. And immediately I knew Mike and I have to talk oh, about for this. Sure. One. I'm so glad you picked it. The untold series on Netflix is really good. They do one about the Florida Gators. They do some basketball ones. They do a bunch of different sports. Um, and so I was super excited. Uh, and people I know have already, you know, listened to this one, watched this one, thought about it. So I, when Andrea posted about it, it jogged my memory like, oh, yeah, I remember that had happened. I haven't seen that yet. So this was a treat for me as well. It's a very, um, I think the it's about an hour and a half long. So it's a great, you know, weeknight movie, you know, right after dinner or a nice curl up on a weekend type of movie. So it's very easy to watch. I didn't know what to expect. I'm not a true crime enthusiast. Neither am I. I don't follow those blogs, but this was definitely interesting. Um, I was excited. My husband and I blocked out time. We sat down and we put it on and we watched it. And to say that there were many, many parts that were unexpected. Uh, totally. The story itself is one that on the surface, it feels like you would know what's going to happen. It, but there were a lot of things in there that I was not expecting. What? Well, so for me, the most unexpected part is at first I thought, oh my gosh, this is the Jersey Shore's own a hockey team like that's what I was like when we first started <laughs> and it opens with Richard Brosal the UHL commissioner like kind of lambasting them so later on spoiler alert later on when he is like their biggest fan that shocked me to no end but I didn't know what to expect at all and the thing that I'm the thing I most didn't expect is that Partway through this thing, I was rooting for AJ, and on some level, I was rooting for Jimmy Galanti, who was an actual mobster. You are not wrong. This caught me completely off guard. I, knowing, you know, coming into the story, you see it at the beginning, and you're like, oh my gosh, these bad guys. How annoying of them to buy this team. <laughs> How thoughtless of them to think so little of a sport that means so much to so many people that they could just do this and care less about it. But you're right. Uh, as the story unfolds and you see the type of impact that this team had on the community at large, 
uh, you take things with a grain of salt, right? Like you, as a fan, cannot help yourself but think, wow, what a great thing this was. How exciting was it to be there? How wonderful was it to be an actual fan of the Trashers? So much so that I Googled yeah. Trashers memorabilia last yeah, night. Yeah. So I, I got to agree with you, Andrea. The, the same ways in which I became a more committed hockey fan both to my my Idaho Falls Spud Kings and to uh, and to the Seattle Kraken, but also you know I've I've watched hockey uh, college hockey at various different locations and different schools, but that same fandom, especially in those two in the two teams that I really like the most, and, and to a lesser extent the Golden Knights, they're my number two NHL team, and I know they're your number one. <laughs> um, uh, that that fandom developed in a similar way that these trashers fans fandom did like yes. the fights are kind of fun now now i'm telling you the fights with the trashers they went too far um but yes. like way too far like it actually i had to look away yeah, it actually made me feel guilty for cheering for fighting so much at spud king's games <laughs> i know oh no i know there's a little bit of that um parental like, oh no, we should not be doing yeah, this. This is, this is not good. This is not good. Um, yes, there's a little bit of that uh, guilt in there about rooting for bad boys on the ice. Oh, no question. But at the same time, that definitely gets crowds going, right? Well, and and so the story pops out, starts out with sort of an introduction that's sort of roundabout to to Jimmy Galanti. You don't really know what he's done. You don't really even know what, who he is, um, other than his son is like a Jersey Shores type character who is kind of a punk. But then you later learn that he wasn't always a punk. And, and eventually, the story of this family is such that Jimmy Galanti was a football fan. He wanted to get his son into football. His son wasn't into it. His son saw... Ba, ba, da, ba, the Mighty Ducks right. and becomes a massive hockey fan and a, a good player himself, right? Right. He went from hating to be in the backyard with his dad in the football to only thinking about hockey. Only His life was consumed with being a hockey player watching hockey, being hockey at the rink all the time. And Jimmy Galanti tells a story like many hockey parents that soon they were to the only thing they remember was to and from the rink, to and from the rink. Yeah. And so as, as AJ starts to get older, he starts to uh, play hockey in his, in his high school years and starts to develop a little bit of a reputation. Yes. Um, now, to contextualize it, some say that the TV show The Sopranos is based off of the Galanti family, um, which is like a crazy piece of like context. So Jimmy's Jimmy's right. makes his money in trash collection, um, and and AJ grows up in that environment. But it's 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 mob based trash collection. Like like you're gonna do our trash collection service. Or you're gonna have your truck get blown up, um, right? And his dad literally. The, the funny thing is, like he's he's a he doesn't care about the money so much as he cares about his family, his children, his two children, or what he yeah. loves. He loves his spouse, um, which which makes you sort of like endeared to this mob person. Like he's really bad, but like he's a family man, so you sort of feel like yeah. oh, okay, it's okay. But like growing up, AJ had like The Rock and China come to his birthday party. Like it's not a normal like thing. So he's this WWE guy and also loves hockey. And basically those two loves get combined eventually in this team. Yes. So as he thinks he may pursue a professional career or a college level career in hockey, he suffers a debilitating injury his senior year in high school. Well, so part of that is because his dad went to jail when he was in eighth, eighth or ninth grade. And like, he starts getting made fun of cause like he's a daddy's boy or something. I don't know. 
And so he tries to project a hard image. And so then he's like a fighter hockey player. And that's what contributes yes. to that. Great. And d- the development of young man without his dad and everyone knows that his dad has gone away. Yeah. Gone away, quote unquote, um, for a little bit because he made some mistakes and uh, he then has to deal with that. And this is how he ends up dealing with it. And this being hard WWE fan and hockey player comes out on the ice and he is doing his level best to try to to try to really um, make a name for himself. For himself. He's he's devastated, right? Because this injury yes. destroys his hockey career, and his dad thinks, "What can I do? What is the thing to solve?" Now you got to think all the while. Meanwhile, the FBI <laughs> is looking seriously into the Genovese family and into Jimmy Galanti. And into um, yes. this one guy um, who worked closely with Jimmy Galanti. His name was Matty Ionello, and he's the Genovese crime family. So these are these are they're really they're tied so closely. So he did, so the FBI is investigating them all the while this is going on. Oh. And Jimmy Galanti doesn't care. He's just he doesn't even think any. He thinks he's untouchable. But to give you an idea of the character of this guy, Jimmy Galanti. The, the 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 middle school coach of his son AJ, who later becomes the equipment manager for this Danbury Trashers team, he says he's a scary, scary person, and I'm a pretty good judge of character, so I took a liking to him, <laughs> which was like the craziest, <laughs> like, oh, this is a group of people. And they're just basically thugs, right? So so what yeah. does he do? He <laughs> decides to buy a hockey team. And make his son president of this hockey team. Yeah. I there's well, one, I I would have loved to be given a a professional sports oh, totally. team. <laughs> I mean, when I was eighteen, uh, this kid's literally recovering from a traumatic injury and for graduation slash his eighteenth birthday, he gets a professional hockey team in his town. And the way it's announced is so interesting. Like he's walking (laughs) through the halls at school and his friends are looking at him with like wonder and mystery and like excitement. And then people like, it's so cool what they're going to, what they're doing for you and what's, what's happening with the hockey team. And he doesn't even know what's going on. He goes to the paper and in the paper, his father announces that he's bought this hockey team and made his son president and CEO or whatever the title is. (laughs) General, general manager. manager, president, and general manager. Meaning, he is the one who's going to get to put this team together. And how does he even do that? You know, I don't know. <laughs> I, there, he is a hockey fan, so there's a little bit. Of, I mean, there's that, right? He he understands the game, so he, which to his credit, which I think this is one of the things that makes this story so palatable i think is the only word i can you know makes the idea so palatable he is a true hockey fan he played hockey he knew and understood the game he also had a real deep understanding of what people wanted to see and how people wanted to be entertained so here's this kid he's only 18 but he's been playing hockey for years and he goes into this situation and he knows exactly what he needs to do in order to bring this team together. Again, he he's coming from an actual place of knowledge. So I think he, he made some steps and he put together some, he pulled some players and he started to create this thing. And I think it's fascinating. You talk about how it's palatable. I think it, the reason it's so palatable is AJ is basically an innocent, Right. Yes, he encourages fighting, yeah. and yes, he's a mobster son, and he's very loyal to his dad, but basically, he's an innocent, and I think that's what we all connect with. We connect with AJ more than anything, and this whole, like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? And they start this thing off by getting Brent Gretzky. They, I mean, it's a brilliant marketing plan. Um, yes. but and, and the guy he helps, he asks to help pick him, pick the team for him with him 
is Tommy T-Bone Pomicello, and this is his middle school coach. I mentioned him before, and this guy is crazy, but he knows a ton about hockey, and he just is like, he helps him out. So he shows him the photo of a guy in a in an orange jumpsuit. He, he knew of a guy, and he suggests that this is this is a player you need. And his name is Brad Wingnut Wingfield. And he's literally an, a, a, an ex-con who, like, is in jail for, like, beating people up and playing hockey. And, like, he's, like, aggressive. But he's so into this. Even at the end of this whole thing, he loves Jimmy Galanti as, as, a, as an owner. And, and yeah. he, is, he is a brutal hockey player. He's a good hockey player. But he is a fighter. As they as they start to piece this 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 team together, uh, AJ really takes takes this seriously. Oh, he does as serious as anybody could, and he starts to create this team. In addition to the, quite frankly, even with the commissioner of the league, like breathing down their necks because. The commissioner is not going to let this become a laughing stock. No. He does not want the bad image to creep in. He he is going to hold them to some sort of accountability. But AJ persists. Yeah. And he continues to put this team together. Yeah, the commissioner even says not any one person should think that they're bigger than the league themselves. But this this Tommy Palmasello says, uh of Richard Brosell, he says he was a minnow in a shark tank. And I think that's true. Like Jimmy Galanti's yeah. whole thing, like the people they got, the the one eye Willie and the the Ramon Durr and the twins, the almost Sioli brothers, they were fighting mm-hmm. hockey players. That's who they got to play in this team. And and AJ also trusted his gut. He got good players. He got he he really did put this image of the bad boys of hockey. In fact, they had T-shirts with it. Um, yes. But the Danbury excitement, to me, it resembles the excitement that we have over the Spud Kings. Like something really cool has finally come to our town. It, it, it was amazing to see how even in their, the way it was portrayed in this documentary, they had actual fans uh, who were huge fans of the, the trashers is very similar to the way we feel in our region about our newest, our new hockey team and how nobody knew that this was coming and it kind of just surprised us all and how exciting it is and how well attended it's been. The one difference I'll say though, is from the very get go, this was an orchestrated attack. Like one thing that one of the differences I noticed, <laughs> is that the Spud Kings are such a professional organization. Their social media is so beautifully cultivated as being good for these young men and for the community. And like, there's honor and dignity. These guys, the Danbury <laughs> Trashers, like they set out to have Brad Wingnut, Wingfield, give a look at Jimmy Galanti. And then he was like, it was like the, the puck drop happened. And then he was all over this guy's ear. They were rewarded for that. Oh, definitely. They were they're paid under the table, all kinds of money. I mean, they weren't initially investigating Galanti for the Danbury Trashers. The Danbury Trashers was a right. way for them to get undercover, uh, the FBI to get undercover and investigate his his other dealings. But eventually, they started investigating their dealings with the Trashers too, because the yes. money was so good. I mean, every one of these people they signed said the money was so amazing of course i was going to be a danbury trasher and again this is the top level of minor league just below nhl and by design because you could attract those who wanted to get close enough to the nhl um, or even that that you had some really great talent there and yeah um they took care of their players now initially the commissioner didn't like this, right? But then he no. started to see. So he at first he was like thinking they were making a mockery of the game because you know in hockey, yeah, there's fights, two to three fights a game. The commissioner was saying there were at least eight fights in every game, 
And he started banning players and he started getting really angry. The fans got into it though, bringing body bags to the games and like crazy ruthless, just, just savagery in their cheering. This special section, one oh section one oh two. One oh two. It was like a family. Yes. I love when sections of season ticket holders or those who who come create this kind of um I I because I'm in marketing, I'm gonna say brand, but kind of create this this thing for themselves that um this is how this is how we do it. This is how we are um a family. This is how we are together. This is how we watch the game together. And section 102 definitely did that. And yeah, they were the section directly behind the visiting bench. So that poor visiting team would sometimes have the hardest uh, time just talking to each other Oh yeah, because the section was so loud. And to add to it, not just that it was, it wasn't just the section taunting them and like throwing stuff at them and like, like, like the equipment manager guy literally sabotaged them. Yes. I think the commissioner talks about how he's the only one who's ever, he's the only professional hockey commissioner to ever uh, suspend an equipment manager. <laughs> I forgot about that. Yeah. For, for doing things like turning off the hot water in the visiting clubhouse. Yeah. And giving them towels so thin that it would barely like cover their bodies and it would like basically fall apart and and then only giving six towels to the opposing team. I mean, literally psychological <laughs> warfare every yes. night. Yes. The, the trashers were developing their own style. But they were winning <laughs> 70% of their games. Um, but the commissioner said, I felt like I had been committed into a cuckoo farm in that first year. But just really at the beginning... Then something interesting happens. The wing nut, winger, Wingfield, he gets attacked by um, Josh Elzinga, um, a member of the uh, Kalamazoo team. And he, it's a dirty, you know, whatever. But I mean, again, the Trashers fought dirty. And so the other opposing team members fought dirty back. And winger's leg is broken. And everyone on the team gets revenge after that. Um, in fact, Jimmy was fined and, and briefly arrested uh, because he hit an, an official over this thing and everyone went crazy and they needed to replace Winger. The idea that one of your best team, I mean, and not just the team, but the team and the fans rose up, if you will, and thought this is, and I think Jimmy Galante says that it was it was us against the world. Yeah. It was, they have hit us so hard and so done us so wrong that this, we have to, we have to retaliate. We have to not let this sit unanswered. And the fans got into it also. And what's crazy is there's a, there's a, in 2004, the NHL season gets canceled uh, because of player negotiations and what have you. And, So the previous year, um, New Jersey wins the Stanley Cup and Mike Rupp is the name that um, that he he wins the the winning goal for the Stanley Cup. And it's the name that AJ keeps thinking, I've got to get him on my team. So they call him up and they literally tell him they'll give him a bag of money. And he's not doing anything. He can't play for the NHL right now because their their season's canceled. So he does it. (laughs) <laughs> so he shows up as a Danbury treasure. Totally. And like they start to kick butt and they make it all the way to the Colonial, Colonial Cup. Cup. Thank you. That's what the UHL's cup is. So they make it all the way to the Colonial Cup. They end up losing. But meanwhile, the FBI has used the, the, the trashers as their geolocation to tracking all of the criminal activity um, that's happening in the Galanti family. And uh, they they raid on the warehouse, and then everybody knows what's going on. And Galanti just talks like it's no big deal. Like, mm, who cares? Um, and then when they play Kalamazoo again, it's 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 called Wingfield versus Elzinga game, right? And there's just aggressive fights, 
and uh, it, it's just crazy. And it all comes crashing down on June eighth, two thousand six. There's one hundred and seventeen counts of an indict of indictments. Uh, Ionello and Galanti are both taken out. I think Galanti gets ninety three counts initially. Um, significant issues, but actually they use the trashers as part of their their framing for the indictments. Financial uh, finance hockey team through money laundering picked up by the FBI, sequestered, answered questions. It's an it's it's over for him at this point. Correct. So not just over for Jimmy Galanti. Oh no, but no yeah. Over for the trashers. Everything falls apart. Um, the FBI said they couldn't let the trashers continue because. It wasn't ethical play, right? Like they were all being paid way more. But here's what's interesting. By this point, the commissioner has been won over by Section 102. <laughs> He's been won over by the Galantes. They they do a little bit less of the sort of really bad stuff that they did in their first season. And and he just he thinks they're great. <laughs> and so he gets picked up by the FBI, sequestered and asked questions. And they really wanted the commissioner to turn on the Galantes. And he never did. He just mm-hmm. simply said, look, these guys love hockey. Of course, he didn't know all the details, right? He wasn't privy right. to that information. But like what he was privy to was Jimmy Galanti loved his son. His son was very good at picking. I mean, he turns out to be this great general manager, right? Um, Great. and, uh, he made the league better and he brought the league attention. He brought NHL stars and he, he improved it. So he, the commissioner didn't turn on Galanti. No, in fact, the commissioner developed this, this abnormal endearment yeah. for the Galantes. But I think I, and, and we talked about it. We did too. We, yeah. um, had started to by the end of this documentary, even though we knew they were bad people started to have this endearment for them because they had done so much to improve the experience of being a hockey fan in Danbury and section one Oh two and die hard, die hard fans like the St. Clair, the St. Clairs, the uh, couple, um, were devastated when their hockey team was taken away from them. The turning point for the Galantes really is the FBI <clears throat> goes to the dad and, and tries to use AJ as a pawn. Now, AJ, like we talked about at the beginning, he was an innocent. Um, but the FBI could have argued that AJ was aware of this stuff and could have gone after him. And that's what they use against Jimmy Galanti to get Jimmy Galanti to, to go into a plea deal and he takes it for so that his son won't. And now he's guilty of sin, of course, but he pleads guilty to, and he spends 87 months in a federal pl- prison. So he then goes away for seven years. And AJ knows now that he has to kind of do this on his own. And he, he gets his degree. He goes to he works a regular job for a while. And then he develops Champs Boxing Club. And it gets attention on ESPN and Sports Illustrated. <laughs> labeled eventually, one of the fights he promotes is labeled "Fight of the Year." I mean, I am amazed that he comes out on top. And so, yeah. anyway, Dad gets out of the the slammer, and there's a reunion, and they run uh, in 2015. They run a boxing show at the Ice Arena, and there's just these scenes of the reunion, and there's a reunion with Section 102. And there's even a reunion with Wingfield and Jimmy in the documentary. Um, Who hadn't seen Jimmy, Wingfield hadn't seen Jimmy in almost 15 years. Yeah. And it's actually quite beautiful because before the reunion, right before the reunion, they have Wingfield on on camera saying, man, I wish I had kept in touch with Galanti. I I wish I would have, I wish I would have been working for him the whole time. He was, he always took care of us. You know, he really believed in what we were doing. And, you know, this is why these are complicated people and complicated feelings. I never thought I would feel yeah. like that about a mobster. I mean, he like literally set other competition <laughs> trash, crash collector trucks on fire. Like other garbage men's right. lives were threatened by what he did. And he endorsed like absolute felonies. Um, 
But um, but we also gave two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to the local children's hospital. Yeah, I mean there is there is good in everyone. Yeah, and he was a, he was a good family man. He was good for the community. He was seen as a pillar of the community in in the media, right? Like he was not portrayed right. as a mobster. But everyone no. on the team knew he was because, I mean, they were being paid on the they table, knew. getting – they had multiple jobs where they never showed up for work for multiple shell companies, right. you know, making just great money for a minor league player. I mean, I'm sure their salaries were that equivalent of some of the um, lower-level NHL players. I mean, they were making yeah. good money, especially if they're bringing in – Mike Rupp and and others, you know, who are who are, are quite talented. So anyway, they were the bad boys of hockey. Um, and and that's the story. Uh, I don't know. What do you think? Do you think that this is this documentary portrayed the real truth of the story or did they did it really try to win us over? I think I think they tried to portray and to get across the actual story of what happened. Yeah. I think, however, there is the element of sports involved. And when you talk about fandom like that, all judgment is cloudy. Yeah. <laughs> all, all judgment is t- well, typically now I wouldn't say all judgment, but typically your judgment is set aside because you have this, overriding expectation and joy for your team. Yeah. And if you enjoy sports at all, you know what I'm talking about. Totally. And you, I think that just because of that, it's hard to present it as anything other than a love of a game. Yeah, I think you're right. And, and again, the goal of the documentarians is to, to tell the story, but at the same time, I mean, didn't you want to think, oh, man, I wish they would bring back the Danbury Trashers? Oh, man. Oh, totally. I think there's an element of the crime story that was left out. I didn't feel like the documentary did full justice on the criminal activity because you were it was a sports lens, right? You were totally focused on how this was a sports story. You were not focused on how this was, like, mostly a crime story. Kudos to Netflix, um, ringing endorsement for this. Um, I was hooked from the very first couple of minutes. One of the most entertaining documentaries I've ever seen. Very Jersey Shore, but very entertaining. <laughs> and um, and really, uh, what a great uh, addition to the sort of lexicon of hockey, hockey stuff on TV and movies. And what an interesting episode in hockey history i think that's gonna do it for us i think we're both in agreement this is great oh it was great i want to know what viewers think and what viewers want to do us to do next time what's our next what's the next thing we're going to review i have some ideas i'm i'm really itching at the bit with the mighty ducks especially after this well one. maybe now that's exactly since aj his love of hockey grew from the mighty ducks we might have to as an ode to him so I would love to hear what viewers think, and that, but that's where I'm going. <laughs> so leave a comment. Leave us a rating, five stars, please, uh, wherever you find your podcast. Uh, that's how more people will hear about this, and we're able to do more of these. Or you can reach out on our Facebook page, Crashing the Net, uh, and let us know that you heard about Scripted Ice. We're um, excited to continue this series. So for Andrea Todd and Mike Walker, you've been listening to Scripted Ice, a Crashing the Net podcast on the Idaho Hockey Network.